Good morning, and um, I'm delighted to have been invited here to speak to you. Um, it's really good that you've had the, uh, really some really positive messages about how um, good networks can be in terms of supporting disabled people in the community. Unfortunately, um, my subject is um, not as uplifting. So bear with me. Um, the CPS that I work for is the uh, principal prosecution service for criminal cases in England and Wales. Our fundamental role and purpose is to protect the public, support victims and witnesses, and deliver justice. In the main, we're reasonably successful at achieving our aims. However, some of you may know that in March of last year, the Director of Public Prosecutions for England and Wales, Keir Starmer QC, gave a speech entitled Prosecuting Disability Hate Crime, The Next Frontier, in which he described society as a whole as being in the foothills when it came to disability hate crime and supporting victims and witnesses with disabilities. This is because, although there's clear evidence that disability hate crime is widespread, many thousands of cases undoubtedly go unreported each year. The Disability Rights Commission um, Attitude and Awareness Survey 2003 revealed that 22% of disabled respondents had experienced harassment in, in the public because of their impairment. Research by MENCAP found that 90% of people with a learning disability had experienced bullying and harassment. 66% of people with a learning disability had been bullied regularly, with 32% stating that bullying was taking place on a daily or weekly basis. And the most recent British Crime Survey Supplement report for 2012 reported that there are 65,000 crimes each year where the victim believes that the motivation was hostility or prejudice based on dis disability or perceived disability. By stark contrast, Although the number of cases referred to the CPS to consider for charging has increased considerably since 2007, the numbers are still very low. In 2007-8, we considered 279 cases and charged 187 individuals with disability hate crime. By 2010-11, this had increased to 690 cases considered and 482 charged. The rate of successful outcomes, that's the number of people convicted, has also increased from 77% in 2008 to just under 80% in 2010 11. Now, although there's no direct read across and the temptation to draw comparisons should be resisted, the figures for other forms of hate crime are significantly different. So far as racially and religiously aggravated hate crime is concerned, in 2007-8, the CPS considered 12,996 cases and charged 9,115. By 2010-11, that figure had gone up to 13,445 cases, of which 9,722 were charged. The success rates are also different. In 2007-8, just under 80% 
of racially and religiously aggravated crimes were successfully convicted. That figure is now 83%. So, what is disability hate crime? And why do we prosecute so few cases? There is no specific offence of disability hate crime, but the agreed definition used by criminal justice agencies in England and Wales is any criminal offence which is perceived to be based upon hostility or prejudice towards the victim because of their disability or perceived disability by the victim or any other person. Sections 145 and 146 of the Criminal Justice Act place a duty on courts to increase the sentence for any offence shown to be motivated by hostility based upon the victim's actual or presumed disability, or for any offence where a defendant demonstrated hostility based on the victim's actual or presumed disability. However, although we describe this type of offending generically as hate crime, the legislation only requires evidence of hostility rather than hatred. That does not provide the definition of hostility. So in the absence of a legal definition, we use the, defini um, the dictionary definition, which includes ill will, ill feeling, spite, contempt, prejudice, unfriendliness, antagonism, resentment, and dislike. For the purpose of section 146, disability means any physical or mental impairment. And it applies whether the person actually is disabled or not. It's whether there's a presumption. If the court finds that an offence was committed in such circumstances, they must state in open court, they must state this in open court, and state that the sentence has been increased by virtue of the aggravation. So although I've given you um, the agreed definition of a disability hate crime, I think that the meaning of disability hate crime is best demonstrated by reference to a real case. Two years ago, Gemma Hater was 27 years old and lived independently. She had a number of lifelong health difficulties and development issues, although there was never a clear diagnosis of a specific medical condition underpinning this. She also had a learning disability that limited her level of understanding. Chantel had known Gemma for several years, and Gemma considered her a friend Nevertheless, Chantel generally treated Gemma badly, calling her names, um, and on one occasion actually shaved Gemma's hair off as a joke. On the 7th of August, 2010, Gemma was out drinking with Chantel and four friends. Gemma told the doorman and the bar staff that Chantel was 15 years old. And as a result of this, they were barred from going into any further pubs that evening because of the pub watch scheme. Chantel became angry with Gemma and went on to assault, physically assault her because she'd spoiled her night out. The following day, Gemma went to Chantel's flat where a group of friends including two males, Daniel and Joe, had been drinking and smoking during the day. Over the course of the evening, 
Gemma was subjected to prolonged and serious assaults, including being headbutted and hit with a mop. She suffered several fractures to her nose. She was forced to drink urine, which had been put into a can of lager. Her mobile phone was taken from her, flushed down the toilet, and she was locked in the bathroom for several hours. Gemma asked to be allowed to go home, and eventually, shortly after midnight, she was released. They did not take her home, however. They led her instead to a disused railway, where she was again physically assaulted and stripped naked. Her clothes and personal belongings were set on fire. A black bin bag was put over her head and she was stabbed in the neck. Gemma's body was found by a jogger at 5.30 the following morning. Her attackers were all subsequently all convicted of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. Now, although the facts of this case are shocking and clearly at the extreme end of disability hatred, as it resulted in the tragic death of a young woman. However, the, the, the case itself has some of the elements that are too often present in disability hate crime cases. The first is that the victim was well known to the perpetrators and in fact considered them to be friends. The perpetrators acted as a group. We often hear about complaints of groups of people attacking or being abusive. There had also been a history of previous offence, of previous incidents, which had started off with name calling and minor assaults, which gradually over time escalate. And also, the victim was humiliated in the course of the assaults, and we often hear of degrading behaviour, um, shaving of hair, urinating, things of that nature. So we can all be in no doubt that disability hate crime in all its forms attacks the basic human rights of disabled people to live free from fear of harassment. These crimes are based on ignorance, prejudice, discrimination and hate, and they have no place in modern society. So what is the CPS doing to prosecute these crimes? Firstly, our increased understanding of the particular complexities surrounding the prosecution of hate crime has led to the development of a suite of hate crime policies and guidance for prosecutors. All of these policies were developed with the involvement of specialist voluntary sector organisations and people directly affected by the policies. So, for example, in relation to our disability hate crime policies, we worked with disabled people and disabled groups. Each policy explains the relevant law and deals with the application of the Code for Crown Prosecutors, our approach to victims and witnesses, and sentencing. To support our policy and guidance, the completion of e-learning training packages on prosecuting hate crime and on supporting victims and witnesses with mental illnesses, learning disabilities or autism is mandatory for all lawyers. And to ensure that we um, prosecute cases to a high standard, in April of 2010, we published our core quality standards which set out the quality of service that the public are entitled to expect from us. We also have a number of structures in place to support the implementation of our policies. 
A national hate crime coordinator network has been established across the CPS. The role of the hate crime coordinator is to monitor the effectiveness and, of um, local policy implementation and to review individual cases where necessary. And we also have a range of local scrutiny and involvement panels, which members of the community and our lawyers look at the way that cases have been handled and see where we can go, what, what we can do better, how we can build better cases. In terms of some of the reasons why I'm running out of time, um, in terms of some of the reasons as, you know, why we still see such underreporting um, of cases um, is firstly at the heart of this. Um, I'm sorry. Disability hate crime is still very much a new concept to the public. They find it very difficult to understand that people will be attacked because of a disability. So we've heard from the earlier speakers, you would expect there to be more of a feeling of building a community around our disabled people. So the concept that this exists is very difficult for people to understand. And surprisingly also, it's very difficult for disabled people themselves, often those with learning disabilities, to understand the concept that they are being subjected to hate. And often, therefore, um, when disabled people are out in the community, in their daily lives, and they are subjected to abuse and bullying, um, what they will do is to report what's happened to them to the first, whether it be a carer or wherever it is they were going, if they were on the, the way to the doctor, if they were to a community centre, they will report that to the first person they see, the first professional they see, rather than think about going to the police. And these disclosures often very, happen very frequently because they generally happen at the end of a difficult journey when, you know, the individuals ask, so how are you today? How was your journey? And we find that a lot of disclosure is made to third parties, not to the police. So what we have done is um, issued a series of, um, started a, a series of um, what we call navigators workshops whereby we um, inform third party teachers, social workers, community workers, etc. We, we, we teach them how to recognize what's being disclosed to them and to know what to do with that information. Um, I'm going to have to publish my speech on you because I'm going to have to cut lots and lots of it out for you, but it's, trust you, all, all very interesting. But I just want to finish on telling you um, in the future what we plan to do. Um, we are constantly committed to learning from cases, from our approach. We have had some successes in prosecutions, which um, I'm not sure that I have time to go into, but, I will, um, but we have had successes. We've been able to use in terms of um, when cases do get to court to, to ensure that we get the best evidence from witnesses, the special measures that are available in terms of court intermediaries, and we've pushed back the boundaries in, in um, getting evidence in situations where we never thought possible before. And going forward, we plan to continue to learn from our successes and from our failures. And we know that in terms of changing public attitudes, the uh, recent Paralympics did a lot in terms of presenting some really positive images of disabled people. However, we still have, as a society, 
more to do before we truly shift public attitudes and move out of the foothills when it comes to disability hate crime and supporting victims and witnesses with disabilities. Thank you.